verse 4. That's where I'll begin reading, and that's where I'll be teaching this morning. 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. And do not spare the ancient world from a perverse, but, but perver- pres- preserve Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he, brought, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having been made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the essential conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous men, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from the temptation to keep the unrighteous under punishment on the day of judgment. But especially those who indulge in the flesh and its corrupt desires and despise authority. Daring self-will, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majestics. Whereas angels who are greater in the might and power do not bring reviling judgment against them before the Lord. You may be seated. We have gathered in this place, Lord, because we love you. We understand the value in the scriptures. We love the scriptures. We know that this moment we want to hear about the scriptures. Lord, speak to us. Remind us. Warn us. The judgment that will take place to those who teach false doctrine. I pray that we would see the importance of eternity. And that the temporal is but a moment. I pray also, Lord, that we will understand and that you will help us to understand the joy and the satisfaction that we can, we can in, 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 engage in and, and see when we focus on you. Help us this morning to concentrate on your word. In the name of the Father and the Son and the tender Holy Spirit, I pray. In the previous Sunday, I introduced the text and I titled the message, False Teachers. And I thank you for your reply. I thank you for responding to the message from our previous Sunday. This morning, we want to talk about judgment to those false teachers, those false prophets. There's a principle in the Bible It's called, you reap what you sow. That's a biblical principle. And this morning we'll see, with three examples, that people who who promote false doctrine, false prophets, and false teachers will have to pay the consequences of their wrong teaching. I'd like you to go with me to 2 Timothy Chapter 3, verse 13, for our memory verse of the week. Second Timothy, chapter 3, verse 13. This is what the Bible says. Evil men and impostors will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. The Apostle Paul writes to young Timothy. He writes to his young disciple. He's writing to a young pastor named Timothy. 
And he's reminding him the importance of Scripture, but he's also reminding him the importance of that there's evil people out there. There are imposters. Imposters. We're going to get to 2 Peter in a second, but as a way of introduction, not very far from this church location, another church has opened up. You've seen it. Not very far from us. It's walking distance. It's a stone's throw. It's a church that is not Trinitarian. Do you know what that means? They do not believe in the Trinity. Now, I know our text says that the imposters and evil men and women will sneak in the church. We said that, and that's what Peter is addressing. And the church not far from us has opened up. The former congregation that was there sold the building to this group. And they have a beautiful sign. But I'm warning you. Like I warn people all the time, stay away from people who preach a false gospel. Trinitarian means the triune God. El Padre, el Hijo, y el Santo Espíritu. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This church has moved in. It's in our neighborhood. I reserve to say their name because when I believe that when you say a name, even bad advertisement is, bad, is still advertisement. We should be concerned with that. We should be concerned that a false church has moved into our neighborhood. But even more so, we should be concerned the false teaching moving in or sneaking into the, the body of Christ. Most people could care less what comes into the church. As long as they can sing on Sunday and as long as the preacher opens the Bible, nothing else really matters. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a warning in Scripture this morning in 2 Peter chapter 2. This is a sad chapter in the Bible, but it's a warning to us. It's a warning to church because there are deceivers, there are evil people, imposters, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. I believe elections move us away from the gospel. I believe even the weather moves us away from the gospel. There are all kinds of distractions for us not to remain on the gospel, not to read the word of God, not to study the word of God, not to memorize the word of God. And there is a warning for those who forsake assembling that's warning to those who don't come and hear the word of God. There's a warning. We studied in our previous Sunday that false teachers are all around us. And false teachers come into a congregation and they, they move people away from the truth of God's word. Their ambition is all about economics. They are corrupt and their lives are corrupt. Their conscience is dull, and their goal in life is deception. We've seen that through the years. And if you've been a Christian any length of time, you've seen men and women who have fallen because they have given in to their pride. They have a, a accepted or allowed another spouse in their lives. Their conscience is dull and their, their goal is deception. In Peter's chapter 2 of 2 Peter, he uses the word destruction four times. He's trying to remind the people then and he's reminding us this morning, destruction is going to come to those who preach a false gospel. And the greatest sin... Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest sin that we see back then and we see today is the rejection of Jesus Christ. 
they come into the church secretly. The church is to be on guard. The church is to be the church needs to be reminded that there are false teachers out there. There are fakes and there are plastic people. Plastic. Many years ago, when I started a church in east of Los Angeles, we were in an old Jewish synagogue. And our home church bought the synagogue because they, they, the, 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 the denomination had a Spanish ministry. And they, they kept trying to start a Spanish work. And it, and it start, started with a, a pastor and it would close, a start and a close. And several, several pastors later, they said, send, send Dan. Let's see if he can do it. Richard remembers. He was back there when life was sweeter. We started a church, and I was young. I didn't know what I was. I still. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't. All I knew is I loved the word and wanted to teach it. And so we started in a home Bible study with the largest gang in, in Los Angeles, and we it grew. And and as we were meeting in that particular synagogue, we we changed the name, we remodeled it, and it was humbling. I had a young man who came to me one day outside the church, we were standing there, and he took me to the side and he looked at me and he says, are you a real pastor? 40 years later, are you a real pastor? Are you a fake? I didn't know how to answer that. But what he was taking in his mind, he had seen him come and go. He had seen him on television. He had heard him on the radio. He asked me a question, are you a fake pastor? And that did not resonate with me very well. And I just chuckled. I asked him, what's a fake pastor? And he had seen them come and go. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter is addressing the people there that to watch out because there's fake people out there. Plastic in the Greek. Prophets and teachers, when they, when they come into the church, they come in sheep clothing, but they're disguised as wolves. And Peter warns them. He warns them and he says, keep in mind that those false people will attack the, the, uh, the birth of Christ, whether or not Mary was a virgin. The virgin birth. They, they will attack the deity of Christ, whether or not Jesus Christ is God. The church up the street it says that Jesus Christ is not God. The deity of Christ. We believe and we take the position that Christ is God. The essence of God. Father, Son, and triune God. And, and those false teachers will talk about Jesus is never coming back. He's not coming back. He's, he, you'll never see him. The second coming, they kind of watered that down. And, and one thing about fake and false teachers is they're not submitting to anyone. We studied in our previous Sunday about the sensuality, that the most important thing to a fake teacher, a fake pro prophet, He's thinking only about his flesh. He's only thinking about the gratification of his flesh. He thinks about greed, and he's concerned about, he's not concerned about coveting what other people have. False teachers is what Peter addresses. And Peter made it very clear that false teachers had come, and they've forsaken the, they've forsaken the right way, and now they are going the wrong way. Judgment was sure to come to them. And the final trial was over, but the sentence is yet to be executed because these people, these men and women, will pay the consequences of getting false doctrine out, false teaching. In this section here, Peter proves that judgment, is, judgment will take place, and it comes no matter what, no matter what they say and do and think, Judgment is coming, but the sinner needs to be. The sinner needs to understand that he is secure in Christ. Do not take your eyes off of Christ. And sometimes people put their eyes on man more than they do Christ. 
We sometimes idolize men and women instead of glorifying God the Father. And so what Peter is about to do, he's about to give three examples to verify the truth and the direction that he's headed. And he tells them they're going to be cast in hell. He tells them this is destruction teaching. He tells them, look at, look at the fallen angels, what God did to the fallen angels. He says fire and brimstone is coming. And he uses examples. The doom of the false teachers is going to take place. And we say, why can't it be tomorrow? And false teachers don't come into assembly. They don't come into the assembly and say, look, at, we're false teachers. No, they come in subtly. They sit in the pews or they sit in the Bible study, and then all of a sudden they introduce their teaching. Well, you know, Dan said this, but have you ever thought about this? Have you ever looked at it this way? Or, or maybe there's another gospel. Have you ever heard of the gospel of Thomas? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You need to get in an accelerated program so you can get closer to God and get more information. Dan is only limited. And Drexel only teaches certain aspects of the Bible. We teach the whole thing because we have the market on the truth. Turn, to the, turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2. Look at verse 4. That's where we begin our study this morning in verse 4. Fallen angels. We don't know about the creation of the angels and the fall of Lucifer and his gang. It's a mystery. Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 to 15 describes the fall of Lucifer. And it was the highest angel. And then we see that in Ezekiel 26, the same idea. Lucifer's pride made him mad, and he grasped the throne of God. And, and we know that his pride got the best of him because he wanted to be in charge. He wanted to be in charge. And we know that the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 4, in the book of Revelation, said, it, it suggests that maybe one-third of the angels fell, and Lucifer became Satan, and he became an adversary, adversary, unto God. Where are these angels fallen now? Here's the question. We know that Satan is free and he works around the earth. And we, we know that. And we saw the study in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse stated now just a few months back. And that he has an army of demonic powers assisting him. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I, I want you to turn there. We, we know that Satan is alive and we know he has his demonic forces and he goes around causing havoc to the believers. And Paul writes to the, to the Ephesus church and he says this, chapter 6, look at verse 10. Finally, Paul says, finally, be strong in the strength of whose might? His might, not yours. Because let's admit it, you're not as strong as God. You're a weakling, admit it, you're a weakling. You only stay strong in the word, in the Lord. He says, verse 2, put on the full armor of God. Put it on so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now, it doesn't say go attack the devil. Does it say that? It doesn't say get a group together. Let's go get that diablo. It says what? Stand firm. Say that with me. Stand firm. Let me ask you, why aren't you standing firm? It doesn't say run from him. It doesn't say to pursue him. It doesn't say challenge him. It says when you put that armor, you're going to stand against him. We live in a day and age where people are what? Anxious. They're weak. They're not strong in the Lord. And I take the position that they don't, they don't, they don't put the armor of God on. 
Let's read on. For our struggles is not against flesh and blood. Did you get that? The struggles you have is not against flesh and blood. The struggles, but against the what? Rulers, against powers, against the world, force of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Now, if we, if we can battle the, the spiritual stuff, if we could battle it, if we could see it, we can battle it. We can't see it. There's evil stuff right now in this room trying to get you not to concentrate on what I'm saying. You're, you're thinking about washing the car. You're thinking about whether to go to Culver's or have a burrito after the service today. The enemy tries everything to get you to stop concentrating on God. Put on the armor, stand against it. Peter tells the church of Ephesus it's a spiritual battle. I don't think most people realize that. I don't think most people understand the spiritual forces that are going against us on this earth. We don't understand that. And we give up. And one of the reasons why we're weak is because we're not in the word. We're more concerned about our flesh and more concerned about uh, things of the future that are tangible instead of concern and, and concern about the spiritual aspect of one's life. How can we get strong in the Lord if we're neglecting reading the word? And ladies and gentlemen, do not replace the word of God with music. Please. You're not going to get spiritually strength if you're listening to music. Music is good. It does have scripture in it, but... When you sit alone with God, reading it, studying it, memorizing it, making it part of your life, then you grow in grace and knowledge. Peter said that some angels were confined in hell, and the Greek word is in the underworld, a section of hell where the angels are chained to pits of darkness, awaiting their final judgment. And God judges rebellion. And will not spare those who reject his will. If God judged the angels, and that's the point that Peter is making here. If God judged the angel, who in many respects are higher than man, he will judge the rebellious man. Go with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. All the way in the front of your Bible, Look with me to Genesis chapter 3, and I'd like you to turn to uh, verse 3. Genesis 6, 3. Talking about the old world, and Peter is addressing. The big idea, judgment is coming upon them. And the Lord says, my spirit will all, not always strive with men forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120. God waited 120 years before he sent the flood. Noah ministered. Noah was a, was a messenger. He was a herald of God's righteousness. And the Bible says the wrath of God. Go with me to Romans, back to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. The wrath of God comes on to the scene. Romans chapter, chapter 1, verse 18. Listen. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The truth is being suppressed, pushed down. The truth of God. Today we live in a world where half truth are more popular than truth. Half truth is still what? A lie. So the Gentile nation, civilization, was so corrupt that it was necessary for God to do what? Clean the earth. And cleaning the earth. He saved only how many people? Eight people. No one his family became no one his family because they had faith in whom? 
in God. Nobody believed Noah's message. Nobody. And Jesus made it clear that people were enjoying the normal lives to everyday life that Noah and his family entered into the ark. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke 17. Luke 17. 120 years. And in fact, the people said, rain? Never heard of rain before. What do you mean, rain? No, you're, you're losing your mind. He's building this ark in the what? In a desert. Look at 17. Uh, Luke 17, beginning with verse 26. Look at 26 and 27. And just as it happened in Noah's day, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. 27. They were eating. And they were drinking, they were having a pachanga, fiesta, party time, and marrying, and they were giving away in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Let me, let me make one point before I go any further. God always warns people. Always. Noah builds his ark, 120, 120 years. And I, I, I would gather a lot of people were laughing at Noah. Rain? No way. We've never seen rain before. And the apostates, those who fall away from the truth in Peter's day, use the same point to prove that the day of the Lord will come. Look, go with me back to Peter. I want you to sneak ahead to, to, to Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 3. Know this first of all. That in the last days, Peter says, there's going to be mockers. And they will come with their mocking, following after their own lust. Now, you and I have family members. You try to tell them about the gospel. You try to tell them about spiritual things. You try to tell them the importance of the Bible and the importance of living right you try to talk to them about that, and they what? They just blow you off. They're not concerned. The apostates in Peter's day, they fell away, and, 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 they, and, and they said, well, yeah, that's, that's not going to come. And then what Peter's doing, he's comparing Noah's day to our day. And there are some parallels here. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, there was growing increasingly people were not interested in God. How about today? And the world, Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says that the world was filled with wickedness. How about today? The Bible talks about violence in Genesis chapter 6. We have seen so much violence on television. We have so much, seen so much violence on, on YouTube. We have seen so much violence. We're saying it was more today than back then? No, it's just faster today than we get to see it. There was lawlessness all over the place in Genesis, just like there's lawlessness today. This morning, I said to Kim, the ghetto bird was out last night. Some of you may not know what the ghetto bird is. But in L.A., we call a helicopter a ghetto bird. And he was over our block, over a block, on our, uh, very close to our, our neighborhood. Lawlessness is all over the place. It's been a while since I heard the ghetto bird in our neighborhood. And, it's, and, it, and it caused me to get up from my seat and to peek through the window. I don't know what I was going to see, but I just instinct to go and see. You know, and I said, you know, you're really disturbing my, disturbing my chickens. I probably won't get any eggs tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't need to remind you that true believers are few. Nobody pays attention 
to the true believers, to the cross follow, Christ followers. We know the story of Noah. The flood came and the population of the world was, get this, destroyed. Destroyed. The floods came, the population of the world was destroyed. God indeed judged the people on earth because they did what? They rejected the truth of God. You and I will continue to pray for our family members. You and I want people to believe in the gospel. You and I continually to tell them they must repent and then they must believe. We're constantly telling people, but it's not a very popular message. And most people will will reject the gospel. It'll take maybe one out of 50 people that you invite to a Bible study to finally say, okay, I'm interested. One out of 50. And it gets, it gets gloomier as the years go on. People are not interested in truth. They're not interested in the gospel. They're not interested about giving their lives to God. They're not interested. They are only interested in the temporal. Most do not care about eternity and spirituality. Or if they care about spirituality, it's a different spirituality coming from the Word of God. Look with me to verse 6. Go back to, let's go back to 2 Peter where we launched off. Verse 6. And he condemned the cities of Sodom. He condemned the city of Gomorrah. Verse 6. To what? To destruction. Reducing them to ashes, and he had made them example to those who will live ungodly lives thereafter. This is a very sad chapter in the Bible. I honestly believe that. Because he uses examples of, he uses example of, of cleaning up the earth with the flood, and then he uses the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible says in the King James, Genesis chapter 13, verse 13. But the men of Sodom are wicked sinners, sinners before God exceedingly. And the New American Standard of Genesis chapter 13, verse 13, we read the word, Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. Peter says they were ungodly. Jude says that they were given to fornication and going after strange flesh. Remember I shared with you that uh, Second Peter and the book of Jude, they kind of, they kind of complement each other. They, both writers are, are, are on the same page when it comes to the judgment of God. The men of Sodom were involved with ungodly and unlawful deeds. And since the law of Moses had not been given, the word unlawful cannot refer to the same, the sum of the Jewish laws. In what sense, in one sense, the filthy deeds is unlawful. They were contrary to the nature. Go with me to first, go with me to Romans chapter one. We were there earlier, but I want you to go back to Romans chapter one, where Paul writes to the Romans. In chapter 1, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, Romans chapter 1, Paul writes about uh, men, men who, who favor other men. And it's a it's chapter 1 of, of, of Romans. Look at verse 24. He says, therefore, God has given them up over in the lusts of their own hearts impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Verse 25, for they exchanged the truth. And that's the issue here, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the truth of God's word. When it's all said and done, the only thing the church has is the gospel and the truth of God. That's something worth defending, worth fighting for. 
Look what he says. For the exchange of truth for a lie. The devil is a liar. Would you, would you believe that? He's a liar. Stop letting the devil control and manipulate your life and, and give you, he won't give you thoughts. You give flesh because he does that. But, but, but don't allow him to manipulate you and use you. He's a liar. Worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Verse 26, Romans chapter 1, verse 26. For this reason, Paul writes, he gave them over degrading passion for their, for their woman, for their woman exchanged natural functions for that which is unnatural. Verse 27, in the same way, also men abandon their natural function of a woman and burn in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts, receiving in their own person the due penalty of error. I was talking with a Catholic person this past week. Catholic person mentioned to me that the Catholic Church is losing hundreds, if not thousands, of people all the time. And so the church, the Vatican, has been around a long time of maybe their priest should marry. It's been talked about, as far as I know, maybe 30 years. And, and, and the individual was a Catholic. And I grew up in the Catholic churches, most of you know. And so this Catholic asked me, what do you think about that? And I said, well, it's natural for a man to love a woman. You're speaking to a man that loves a woman for 48 years, and as a result, there are four children and 11 grandchildren. Suppressing the natural function it's not a good idea. And now, some say that Martin Luther broke away from the Catholic Church because he wanted to marry. That's not why he broke away from the Lutheran Church. He broke away from the Lutheran Church because the Catholic Church had ignored the word of God. They suppressed the truth. Paul says here, and when we just look at the function of women burn the desires toward one another, man committing indecent acts, receiving in their own person the due penalty of their error. You reap what you will sow. I want to stop here because there's more I want to say. But I want to close with a story. At a young time in my ministry, I was called to go visit Alice. Alice was a lesbian. Somebody called me to said, Alice has AIDS, and she needs the Lord. And so they call me, they're a friend of a friend, and I show up at Alice's house, and, and she said, Pastor Dan, I don't want to talk to you today. And I said, Alice... Whenever you want to talk, just give me a call. Alice called me a few weeks after, and she said, I want to get right with God. And her lover was there. A lover, or her roommate, her lover, uh, left the room, and Alice and I sat there. Talking about the scriptures, talking about the mercy, talking about the grace of God. She explained to me the gospel. You see, somebody had gone before me to give her the truth. And now, before she slipped into eternity, she wanted to make sure that she had things right with God. Alice trusted in God before she slipped into eternity. She knew her lifestyle. She knew that she was enemies before God. And she had adopted a behavior and she had adopted a culture that she thought was okay with her, but not okay 
with God. We sat there. I wept. She wept. She repented. She wanted assurance to know that she would slip in eternity in the arms of God. I left her apartment. I could not stop weeping. Because I saw the power of God. Ladies and gentlemen, I saw the forces of evil. We don't seem to understand that God's word is powerful, that God's word is truthful, that God's word gives us hope. And people turn the back away from God on a regular basis because they don't understand the truth and the mercy of God. We who enjoy the mercy, we who enjoy the grace of God, God gives all hope in him. Not hope in religion, but hope in him. I got the call. It's a few days after Alice and I in concert, in, in our encounter. And her friend called me and said, Alice passed away. I attended the funeral. I was in on the lineup. I attended the funeral to pay my respects and condolences and the opportunity to tell others about the love of God. Bow with me as I pray. Father, we thank you that truth, truth is so important. And I pray that we as a congregation would understand the truth of your word. Judgment is coming. Days are getting darker, worse, evil people out there. We know that. But, Father, I pray that we would understand that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I pray for our congregation, Lord, that you would keep the evil one away. And keep reminding us how much the word needs to be in our lives. That we must put on the armor that we must stand firm, that we must understand that this world is a disposable earth. It'll be destroyed once again. In Christ's name we pray.